American Legends discusses the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as aviation, sports, politics, civil rights, and business. These are areas where African Americans have been successful despite obstacles which involve racism and also lack of opportunity. Uh, today on African American Legends, we'll be talking with Derek Bell, uh, author, civil rights advocate, and professor of law at New York University Law School. I'm Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr. of the City University of New York Center for Urban Education Policy. And we'll be talking with Derek about how he has used his creative energies and his brilliant intelligence to attack the problem of civil rights in this country. And Derek, having said that, you have written some very, very interesting books. You, the titles alone, Faces mm -hmm. at the Bottom of the Well, We Are Not Safe, etc. And I see this is one of your ways of using your legal expertise and your insight, and I also say anger, mm -hmm. in terms of civil rights. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us how you got into this and what you're trying to mm -hmm. say through your writing? I, I think, to be perfectly frank, I'm trying to make amends. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, I started law school in 1954, and I was very That's impressed. That's a pivotal year. Pivotal year, and I, I was very impressed with the Brown decision. I probably, I was on Law Review, I probably wrote more articles. Uh, in fact, one of the professors said I was trying to turn his Law Review into the NACP branch mm -hmm. or something like that, but I wrote a lot of articles on civil rights. I, uh, I graduated and I talked to the late Judge William Hasty, whose life mm -hmm would certainly belong with one of the legends, the first black federal judge. He held a number of important positions. Graduate of Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C., right? my alma mater. And then uh, uh, um, dean at Howard yeah. and then um, Harvard Law grad. Anyhow, he served, he served my, with my <coughs> dad in the Roosevelt's Black Cabinet. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's right. With yeah. the war, uh, he was with the War Department. That's right. And resigned yeah, uh, because of this. And in particular, I'm a Tuskegee yeah. Airman. He was one of the people who was instrumental in creating the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh, he, he's a real legend. Part. Yeah. But in any event, he, he was clearly a sophisticated man, one of Du Bois' talented ten. And when I went up to see him after when I graduated in 1957 and told him I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer, he said that. Uh, Son, he said, that's very praiseworthy, but of course the Brown decision has been decided, and there's some we mopping don't need up you anymore. <laughs> that's right. He said you were born 15 years too late. Well, I I guess I wasn't discouraged, but I I I felt, and then as we discovered, there was still plenty to be done, and through a uh, number of events, I got to the Legal Defense Fund under Thurgood Marshall, came in 1960s, just at the time of the Freedom Rides, uh, and the sit-ins actually uh, began that year and finally took over a lot of the school desegregation cases. At one point, I supervised about 300 cases, and I thought my place in heaven was secure, mm -hmm. that I was doing it, you know, that uh, this was the way We're to break the down. changing the world. That's, yeah, right. that's, that's right. And I look back now, and I said, oh, my God, how could you have been so wrong? That we came to recognize, as, as my other mentor, Robert L. Carter, the federal judge who worked, uh, with Thurgood on Brown and other cases, uh, said it so well. He said, we thought segregation was the enemy, uh, was the evil. We came to recognize tardily that segregation was a manifestation of the evil. The symptom. The, the symptom. symptom, and that, that the real evil was racism, the determination of white America to remain dominant over black America. And that could take all kinds of forms. In fact, they took what we asked for, equal opportunity, and over the last decade or two have turned equal opportunity into a more effective basis for subordinating black folk than was segregation be before, for all the reasons that, that, that you know. So that um, I guess that uh, after 10 years in, 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 in the uh, uh, civil rights litigation and some administration, and then finally getting into teaching, I really have tried to figure out how we could have been so wrong, how we can learn from those lessons and not simply repeat them again and again, um, and, to, uh, and to try to put that down, often enough, in, as you know, in story form, so people will, <laughs> will want to read it. And so that that's what I've been trying well, to, so to do. Well, so one of the things in uh, We Are Not sa Saved you use the chronicles of the Constitution yes. and some of the, the history that most people don't truly understand. The Constitution yeah. wasn't really written by 
people who wanted equality, it was written by people who wanted to get away from England and get things for themselves. And also and and they protect, protect the property they, they had. Put, and the property were people like us. That's right. Article One. We're in the Constitution. Oh no, written and about ten different places. And <laughs> a lot of people don't seem to understand that because, first of all, it was never taught that way. And now we've got these new pictures about Jefferson and Paris and so on, and beginning to pull the cover off of some of this. But this raises the question about our current strategy. Okay. We've gone through the legal strategy. We won most of those battles. We won uh, Brown. We won the cases against accommodations and recreation facilities. We have the Civil Rights Act, which then crystallized that. We have the Voting Rights Act. But yet, as you've said in some of your writings, and I also say, the situation for the average black person in America today is exactly, maybe even a little worse, than it was 40-some years ago when the Brown case came about. Now, I won't even ask the question, where did we go wrong, because you answered that in terms of racism. But what about our strategies? What are some of the things that we ought to be looking at in, our, in, in the future? Affirmative action, which you said, we talked about the equality, which is what affirmative action is supposed to be about. Now they're using that against us. You have re reverse discrimination, trying to help people who have the uh, yoke of yeah. 350 years of racism around their neck. Uh, what do you think about that? You know, I think, Roscoe, that before we can really identify strategies, we really have to identify what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the subtitle of my other book, uh, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, mm -hmm. of course, is Racism is Permanent. Mm -hmm. Well, people say, well, that's despairing. I mean, that's, what are you asking for? It's a surrender mm -hmm. and what have mm -hmm. you. And, the, and it's not that. I'm trying to get at the truth. And the truth, as you just pointed out, is that for the whole history, of this country. Blacks have provided the stabilizing force mm -hmm. on the bottom mm -hmm. so that millions of whites mm -hmm. who have very mm -hmm. little property themselves mm -hmm. are, able to are able to focus their attention not on those people of other whites who are mm -hmm. way up at the top, but rather focus on blacks mm -hmm. to make sure that, well, that's a wonderful thing for protecting the interests mm -hmm. of those who really have the wealth, mm -hmm. that nobody's really challenging them. Rather, they're challenging whether blacks mm -hmm. should have anything. Well, that's such a marvelous uh, a stabilizing effect that I don't see it changing. So that, as I said, we, that we have more civil rights acts on the books, more favorable decisions in the courts than ever before in our history, and yet our overall situation is worse than it was before mm -hmm. Brown and getting worse because of economic uh, uh, changes in the society that are adversely affecting a whole lot of people. So that, first of all, we have to, before we can kind of think about strategies, we have to think, what mm -hmm. is it that we're doing? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that if we continue on with the we shall overcome, meaning we shall get rid of racism mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and here, we will be equal, we will be accepted. Mm -hmm. If we define we shall overcome that way, mm -hmm. we're never going to do it. But, 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 but the, and this is my hard message, if on the other hand, we see this as a continuum of struggle. Mm -hmm. If we are able, as the uh, New York Times pointed out recently in this uh, article, if we as black people can look back to slavery, not as, as, a, 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 as a sore subject we would rather not talk about, but rather as a source of inspiration. That, and, and we remember what our slave forebears mm -hmm. overcame to survive even, and then to provide the heritage of, mm -hmm. of, of the spirituals and, and a whole re, uh, uh, religious theology and song. Mm -hmm. If we can recognize what they did as property, we can then get a sense of what we need to do as individuals. And that is engage in struggle without regard to whether we are ever going to overcome in a traditional sense. Now, once you get that attitude, once you can get, get that philosophy, then particular strategies and tactics mm -hmm. will come. And those tactics are going to, you know, are going to, br are going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. You see, now what's going to happen to them, we don't know. And at that point, it's not that you don't care, but you don't care as much about the outcome 
as you do about your involvement. The involvement becomes the basis for uh, triumph, in a way. It's a hard message in our bottom line society, but that's, that's my message. But see, you're building on Santiana's uh, admonition. He who forgets the lessons of the past, of history, is doomed to repeat them. Yes. And we've gone through a considerable amount of that. Part of it is philosophical. You know, can you truly get equality among gender, mm -hmm. among people of different color, among people of different language? On the other hand, since this society is built so firmly on an economic free enterprise system, some have suggested that the way African Americans can move is to see if they can't uh, acquire uh, some of the means of production and distribution, which is the economy of the country. Now, of course, that has been uh, dimmed many, many times. Uh, as a matter of fact, African Americans mm -hmm. inherited land coming out of the Freedmen's Act, actually been selling it back to, mm -hmm. the, to the white folks who gave it to them. Or, so, or having it stolen from or them. Or more mm -hmm. than likely having it stolen from them by some type of legal mm -hmm. shenanigans. So that then brings forth the challenge is what are the key points that you might attack as you look at this history mm -hmm. uh, philosophically? Are we to say we are a nation? There are some who said we are nationalists, we are a nation. Or, or, or some who say that we are in a transitional state. Well, mm -hmm. personally, I don't think we are in a transitional state. Uh, but some people say that we are. We're transitioning to be part of the so-called mosaic. Mm -hmm. And the demographics of the country indicate that by 2040, people of color will be the predominant number of people mm -hmm. in this country. They won't be the predominant number of people who, who own the country, because even in the New Deal with Franklin Roosevelt, the percentage of people who own the largest mm -hmm. part of the wealth of this country actually grew smaller, even in the New Deal. So that, that, those are some mm -hmm. of the the uh, factors that influence the struggle. And then, of course, there is the day-by-day -day assault on your individuality, the insults that any black person in this country experiences either directly or indirectly every single day. And I guess that's true about other yeah. groups that have been outside of the mainstream. But as you look at this strategy now, thinking about can we really make a move economically uh, we've tried to make moves politically, the Jesse Jackson candidacy for president, the talk about Colin Powell for president. Uh, where do you think, as you're thinking mm -hmm. of this history and then where we are today and where we want to go, uh, what do you think in terms of some of the areas we might place greater emphasis? Well, I think there are people, as you pointed out, who are committed to nationalism and they want to establish a separate this or whatever, or, mm -hmm. or, or the... Uh, uh, Booker T. Washington mm -hmm. idea of business. Mm -hmm. If that's what they believe, that's what, you, that, that's mm -hmm. what they should do. Uh, some people are committed to the nation of Islam and uh, to building community and what have you in, in that way. That's what they should do, you see. I think if we all could agree, which is <laughs> unlikely, on one strategy, we, it, it, would be, it would be deemed too threatening. Uh, it would, we'd, they'd find mm -hmm. some way of, uh, uh, of making it illegal mm -hmm. or what, what have you. Uh, and so that there, there, there seems to be weakness in, in people having so many different directions, but there is also a kind of protection in that folk don't, are not able to, the enemies are not able to focus on one thing and feel if we do away mm -hmm. with that, uh, uh, that's going to get rid of it. There, there is a, again, going back to basics, there, I quote a, an old uh, black woman down in a rural county in Mississippi where I had unwisely got them to desegregate their schools. And they caught hell. Unwisely? Why do you say because unwisely? Because they, they needed better schools. They that didn't need desegregated exactly. schools. Exactly. Okay. And uh, I didn't recognize it at the time. That's mm -hmm. what they asked for. They mm -hmm. didn't want desegregated schools. And I said, well, if you can't desegregate, then I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. Well, they said, well, if that's what we have to do, that's what we did. Well, it was, they caught hell from, from the white community. And I remember walking up this dusty road with this woman, one of the leaders. And I said, Ms. McDonald. You know, they've, they've been messing with your mortgage in town. Uh, your son has lost his job. Uh, you have your house shot through here a couple weeks ago. How do, you, how do you keep going? And she said, Derek, I'm an old woman. I can't, I can't speak for the others in the community. But as for me, I live to harass white folks. Mm -hmm. In other words, she didn't talk about 
overcoming it. Right. She was going to be on the case. And, 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 and she, there, was a, there, there was this sense of triumph in her voice as she told me, not I'm going to win, but I'm going to be on it. She had no power. She had no economic power. She had no gun. But she was going to be on it. And, and if, we, if, if there was one thing I could do to, to transmit uh, uh, what is needed for our people's survival and moving ahead, it is that sense that I don't care about getting rich. I don't care even about living my full term. I am going to harass those who have been persecuting me. But see, that's and the title of your book, in a sense, your newest book, uh, yeah. Confronting Authority, Reflections of an Ardent Protester. And in a sense, whether you identify that, that's a strategy. Yes. A confronting yeah. authority is a strategy because what it does, it peels back some of that veneer that we accept too easily, particularly mm -hmm. in the age of television. So when you confront a strategy, a racist, and you say this is having an untoward effect on African Americans and we're not going to stand for it. Now, mm -hmm. whenever I give that speech, you give a speech, we're not going to stand for it. We don't say what we're going to do mm -hmm. if we don't secure and that's where I think maybe and if we went ahead and boycotted some of these folks, oh maybe, no, right. maybe we would d and, make an impact. And, and sometimes I think it's a, mis it's, it's, it's a difficulty to wait till you get a consensus, mm -hmm. to wait till you get a majority. Sometimes you just have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had waited till I got a majority of my black colleagues mm -hmm. at the Harvard Law School to decide to take an unpaid protest, I'd still be there arguing mm -hmm. with them about when they're going to mm -hmm. do it and why we shouldn't do it some other way and whatever. Sometimes the individual has to do it. I, I, it was so interesting to read Ellis Kosa's book, mm -hmm. The Rage yeah, of a Privileged yeah. Class. I, I don't like the title. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. So they're not but really privileged. But that's, <laughs> that's right. Not that's, that's right. <laughs> but, but the interesting thing, but all of these black people in these fancy positions who had been humiliated, who had been passed over, who had been, been, been called out of their name, even at these high levels, not one of them, at least as far as these stories are concerned, protested. Mm -hmm. They were all so busy being in the position, trying to move ahead, what have you. And it's, it's that, that they don't recognize the price that they're paying. They, they, they fear what's going to happen if they do stand up. And sometimes that happens. You get, you get pushed aside, you lose your job and all. But when you keep your job on that basis, there's a, there's a terrible price to there's pay. A, see, I've always maintained that uh, white folks in p power position expect intelligent black folks to protest. Yeah. And if you don't, they lose that respect for you. Yeah. And that's something that I guess is difficult to deal with because the system tends to pick out the favorites and tends to say, well, you're good. And even though they don't say somebody else is, is bad, th th they don't get the reward. Yeah. And that is why the, pro and the heroes and the heroines in our community, Afro community, are generally the protesters. Yeah. Even though they may have done something that somebody didn't like, if they speak out, yeah. they're the protesters. Now, the, on the counter side, uh, others in the African American community say, well, look, if we have patterns of behavior that are so antithetical to the values of the larger society, we are doomed to be outside of that society. Now, maybe we might want to be outside of it. And I don't believe I, I think that. you're doomed outside yeah. anyhow, and for precisely the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, you, if we look at the people we really revere, Martin Luther King was a protester. Exactly. I mean, Jackie he, Robinson was a Jackie protester. Jackie Robinson was a protester. S Shirley Chisholm was a protester. That's right. And the ultimate, Frederick Douglass. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So that, that even, and Du Bois. Mm -hmm. I mean, Du Bois was kicked out of the NACP not once but twice. <laughs> and he helped start the organization, but they couldn't, they, they, they were afraid. What he was saying was going to upset the big white folks someplace. Mm -hmm. and, and so, of course, the fact that he turned out to be right. Mm -hmm. Paul Robeson, it's mm -hmm. a one marvelous example. Paul Robeson went down, it seems to me, less because of the opposition he got from the government uh, but than, 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 than the opposition for black people. That's right. You see. And so one of the messages, if you can't help, mm -hmm. don't, 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 don't hurt. But I think that the, the, the general strategy will come when individuals I mean, there were those four boys from Greensboro who went in and sat mm -hmm. down uh, back in 1960 in, 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 in the lunch counter. Large strategies came from that. But if those four guys had waited mm -hmm. till they got a consensus at their college to do it, mm -hmm. they would have never done it. At some point, what you feel is right has to be turned from a feeling into action. And even when that action doesn't do anything, you walk away from it 
maybe uh, less rich, maybe with, le with, with one job less. Or maybe, maybe with knots on your head. Yeah. That's maybe you don't have to do. But there is a feeling inside that you have that nobody can take away. And that's the lesson that I try to get through in many, many ways. The larger strategies will come out of that. But without individuals ready to make commitments, they're, they're, all the rest of it is just talk. Well, I, I agree with you, and I see the thrust you're taking. But Ozzie Davis made a great speech at uh, the first Congressional Black Caucus. It's not the rap, it's the map. Mm -hmm. Not the man, it's the plan. So we got the rap, we got the protest. We, we're out there. At some point in time, and I think you've already given some of the cues to this, we have to take that protest to something that we want to have happen. Like in your case, you were mm -hmm. going for integrated schools. Now many of us recognize, and I mentioned one of the great segregated schools of all time, Dunbar High sure. School in Washington, D.C. Many of us have said it isn't the composition of the racial comment of the students, it is the quality of the curriculum, the quality of the books, the quality of the teachers, the quality of the facilities, so much so. And the parents. So, so, and certainly mm -hmm. the community. So mm -hmm. much so that the new thrust in education now is what they call opportunity to learn standards. Uh, going mm -hmm. to the court saying, regardless of funding and mm -hmm. integration, the opportunities for schools that have predominant number of African American kids are not there. Now, isn't fighting that opportunity to learn uh, strategy one way of moving from this protest into action? Uh, it, it is. Of course, you know, if we had adopted this as a strategy back about, what do you think, 1964, mm -hmm. it, and, and whites would have said, oh, they want to do that rather mm -hmm. than send their kids to our schools? Mm -hmm. Oh, let them have it, mm -hmm. you see. We always come up with these things like the generals fighting the last, the the last war, war the, <laughs> the previous war. Um, uh, but I think that there's more likelihood of coming up with appropriate strategies for today if we can uh, see what we're doing as struggle. As if that is mm -hmm. the essence, mm -hmm. then how you go about it, you don't want to do foolish mm -hmm. things, but how you go about it is much more likely to be focused on what is needed uh, as opposed to what our ideals tell us the end should be. Well, do you think that in the African American community, with uh, a few significant number of African Americans being successful in the business and the corporate world, and then having a larger number on the negative side, the poverty side, do you think that that's going to bring some schism within the African American community as it seeks to change the society? Well, I think it might have. The fact is that because of these major transformations in our economy, a lot of us who feel that we have made it, who wear nice clothes mm -hmm. and have nice offices, are going to, going to find those things in jeopardy. Yeah, they're going to be in Vietnam or Taiwan and somewhere. And that, uh, um, uh, that the gap in the, in the black community is going to be, and already mm -hmm. is, lessening. So that the, the possibility of identification, mm -hmm. which had been gr and narrowing, is going to uh, is going to, is going to increase, but again, I think that uh, rather than waiting for uh, major leaders mm -hmm. to come to, you know, if the people function, the leaders mm -hmm. will come. As that was a situation with with with, with King and, and, and with with Malcolm. Mm -hmm. On the other on and, and on the other hand, the strategies come out of what the people are willing to do. Now we need to be attuned to what that is. But for, for example, with the NACP, if, if we can able to get the restructuring and this planning session, if they go off someplace, I don't care how representative the group is, and plan something that is contrary or not mm. in keeping with what the masses uh, are ready to do, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not going to happen. Well, that's a truism of all politics. That's right. Uh, I mean, that's it what's happening right in our country to today. Have to listen to what the uh, let's face it, 38 percent of the electorate voted. And of that, 21% is responsible for having a Republican-controlled Congress for the first right. time in 40 some years, which indicates that your message, even though it's an Afro-directed message, is a message that this particular republic needs to adhere to, because mm -hmm. democracy itself works on a tightrope. 
No, I, no I, in the uh, it, it's a very tight rope mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in in these days. But it may well be that we we have to uh, look at disaster and impending disaster and in, in, in find opportunities. That it may mm -hmm. well be, as some of the columnists are beginning to talk about, that these crazy folks that we have mm -hmm. uh, that we have an elected to Congress, that the country has elected to Congress, and in the White House and and every, everything else, that the uh, that the way they are moving to undermine traditional programs to help the neediest may be the means for arousing people mm -hmm. so that we make the changes in those programs that even liberals have been maintaining need to need to be made. Right. Now it's risky, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, anything wor that in which is a potential for real gain also has with it a uh, degree of risk. Well, of course, that's the nature of the capitalist system, risk. That, that's, what, that's right. On the other yeah. hand, it's been for for physical acquisitions, and you're yeah. talking about risk in terms of morals and risk in terms of education, risk in terms of just human identity. That's right. What's yeah. your next book going to be about? Well, uh, there's going to be, uh, really, the question that you keep asking me and that I keep evading. <laughs> uh, in uh, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, I looked at all of the reasons why racism is permanent. And in the, uh, the new book, uh, probably out next year, uh, I want to look at more specifically what people uh, uh, might do, given the increasing hostility, mm -hmm. given the retrograde uh, nature of, of, of civil rights policies, uh, 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 given the fact that we are w within the midst of a not very gentle genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, within 10 years, the estimates are, if things keep going even as they're going, half of the young black males will yeah. be not caught up in the criminal justice system, but yeah, actually but in prison, in prison. you yeah. see. So that uh, what is the significance uh, of that for the country? Um, uh, maybe we need to look and see that our most, our strongest group are our women. Um, for a, a range of reasons. Maybe it's time to say to black women, uh, we're going to give up patriarchy, uh, uh, we men. Uh, we're going to let you be the, uh, 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 the leaders. And uh, I can't and wait to read your next book. <laughs> uh, we've been talking with Professor Derek Bell of New York University Law School, and we're talking about just the whole question of how do we deal with racism in America, and I want to thank Derek Bell for being with us today. Thank you, Ross. Mm -hmm.